welcome to online worship at the First Congregational Church of Southington, Connecticut. No matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, or where you are watching us from, you are welcome here. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, a community of faith committed to following the way of Jesus' radical and inclusive love. While I am sad that we still cannot be together for worship, I am glad that we have this way to connect through worship virtually. Today we are in the other beautiful worship space at First Congregational Church, the Barnes Memorial Chapel. When we are able again to gather in person for worship, every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, the worship service occurs in this space. I am so grateful for our church staff, so talented and wonderful, who helped put this worship service together. I am also grateful to Rich McCarty and Chip Hultine, who contributed musical pieces to today's worship. Uh, Chip's song was written uh, by our former senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Gordon Ellis and his brother Mark, so we are blessed to have that music as part of our service today. I'm also grateful to some of our young disciples here at First Congregational Church, Francesca Scavoni and Victoria Scavoni, who did the children's message, and uh, Nea Mulrooney and Nicole Mulrooney, who are reading scripture for us this morning. During this time, I invite you to just be in the presence of God as we worship together. Perhaps you would want to light a candle or bring some other sacred object into the space where you are watching anything that will make this time more sacred for you. We will be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion during this worship service, so I invite you to have with you a piece of bread, a, a bit of wine, or a cup of juice so that we might partake of this sacrament together, even though we are apart. Come now, let us worship God, who leads us like a gentle shepherd into this hour of worship. Please join me in our call to worship. Sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Enter God's gates with praise. Gather before the Lord and rejoice. We bless God's name always. Abundance life. 
Oneness with the God calls humanity to join as partners in creating a future free from want or fear. Life's goodness celebrating that new world beckons from. That all might have abundant life and peace endure forever. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. Good Shepherd, you call us by name, and we know your voice. Open the gate for us, that we may come and go freely, have life, and have it abundantly. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell on the house of my Lord my whole life long. Hi guys! Hi. It's Francesca, Victoria, and Charlie. Charlie is going to be our Baba Black Sheep today. So, do you guys remember David? He was a shepherd and knew a lot about sheep when he wrote this psalm. And that's probably why he felt that Jesus was a special shepherd to all of us. When Carlene went on a road trip to Israel, she saw real shepherds in the fields with their flocks of sheep. Still today, they're out wandering around, leading their sheep just like they did 2,000 years ago. They take the sheep out early in the morning to graze, and they have to lead them to the sweet green pasture grass so that they get nourishment. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Then the shepherd has to protect them when they get to the water because sheep can't tell when their wool coats are getting soaked and heavy with water and they could drown if the current is strong. So the shepherd will actually build a little dam to create a pool of still water for his sheep to drink. They also have to be led on some of the paths because they are not very sure-footed. He leads me beside still water. He leads me in the right paths. On the trip, they also went on this road from Jerusalem to Jericho that is four miles long and has a deep valley with high cliffs on each side, and they call it the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Some places it's known about 15 feet wide, and it is scary because there are wild animals that could attack. 
Even though I walk through the darkest valleys, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And there's poisonous grass there too. So the shepherd walks ahead of the sheep and pulls out all the poisonous grasses, and also a lot of jagged rocks and thorns, so the sheep get cuts and gashes. So every night the shepherd rubs healing oil in their cuts. Thou prepares a table before me. He anoints my head with oil. So when Jesus <laughs> told his followers that he would watch over them like a shepherd, he is probably thinking about David's psalm for the Old Testament. We are all sheep following Jesus, our shepherd, but we are also shepherds when we care for others in the church family. Even though we are not having church together in the meeting house, we are taking care of each other through Zoom, making masks for people, streaming church school and this service, and so much more. Let's thank God for being a good shepherd for us. Bye, guys. Bye. Hope you have a good week. Stay safe and healthy. Say bye, bye. Charlie. Say bye. <laughs>
John 10, 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in any other way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters the, by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep and by name and leads them out. When he brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was trying to say to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for all the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, and the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved, and I will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes to own, only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the Old Testament book of Exodus, Moses, who the one who was to become the great prophet and leader of the Hebrew people, is out on the side of a mountain tending sheep one day when he sees a most unusual sight. He's walking along, minding his own business, and all of a sudden he sees a scrub bush on the side of a barren mountain. It is burning, which actually isn't that unusual in this part of the world, but one thing is unusual about this shrub bush. It is burning, but it is not burning up. The fire leaps through its branches and leaves, but it is not consumed. So Moses goes over to see what's up. You probably know this story, learned it in Sunday school, or maybe from Charlton Heston in the movie The Ten Commandments. God speaks to Moses from this burning bush, gives him a job to do, a huge job. Go tell Pharaoh, God says to Moses, to let my people go. They were slaves, oppressed by Egyptian masters, and Moses will lead them to freedom, but Moses isn't convinced at first that he is the one to lead them to freedom. So he questions God, asks for all kinds of signs, and finally he says to God, when they ask me who sent me, what should I tell them? What is your name? Then, in this miraculous revelation, God tells Moses God's name. It's just four Hebrew letters, yod He wah Y-H-W-H. But here's the problem. There are no vowels, only consonants. yod He wah Y-H-W-H. How do you pronounce a word with only consonants? Well, no one really knows how to pronounce it. If you are reading along in your Bible in the Old Testament and see God referred to as Lord and the word Lord is spelled in all capital letters, the Hebrew text there says yod he wah uh, y h w h A devout Jew reading out loud in Hebrew would say, coming upon that word, Adonai, which is another word which means Lord, and the most common name for God in the Old Testament. So how do we translate this unpronounceable sacred name for God into English? Well, as you would probably guess, scholars have had heated debates about this for centuries, but the most agreed upon translation is, I am. That is God's name. I am. As my Old Testament professor used to tell us, I am means that God is the God who is. 
In the Gospel of John, Jesus adopts the language that describes the name of God in Exodus 3 to explain who he is and what he has come to do. Seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am, followed by a description of who he is. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd, and so on. The I am statements are unique to the Gospel of John in the New Testament. In fact, they are key to John's understanding of who Jesus is. The I am beginning of these statements is even more emphatic in Greek than can really be easily expressed in English. It's two Greek words, ego a me. It's, it's an emphasis that he uses. It's sort of like the emphasis as the plural of y'all that I've taught you before. You remember what the plural of y'all is. All y'all. Well, in John, when Jesus begins a statement with I am, he is literally saying, ego a me, I, I am, with exclamation marks. And one really important thing that all of the I, I am sayings in John share in common is that Jesus uses all of them to talk about his relationship with people, what he is to them. An odd name for God, I am, but meaningful. And Jesus uses that name for God to describe to people who he is. That's really what the entire Gospel of John is doing, describing who Jesus is. And today we encounter perhaps the most unusual I am statement in the Gospel of John. Today Jesus says, I am the gate. The more literal translation of the Greek would be, I am the door. But English translators prefer to use the word gate because in our culture it's hard to imagine sheep going in and out of doors. Having grown up on a farm, I know that there are many kinds of gates. There are those nice wooden ones with a latch and hinges that my grandfather used to build. I loved those because they were so easy to open and close. There are also gates in the barn. You could call them doors on the stalls. There was one in the stall where the milk cow Rhoda was, and there was another in the stall where that stubborn old mule Dolly spent most of her time. Those could be a little bit hard to open. And then there were also gates that were pretty hard to negotiate that you had to be careful with. We had a lot of barbed wire fences to keep the cattle in the pasture. And sometimes, instead of a wooden gate, my father would cut the barbed wire at one end of a fence post and then attach that wire to another loose fence post and make a loop of barbed wire on the bottom and the top of the set fence post. And you would have to put the loose fence post in those loops of barbed wire to close the gate. And you had to be careful with those. Barbed wire is pretty sharp. Jesus said, I am the gate. So what kind of gate is Jesus? Well, let me set the context of Jesus' claim, I am the gate, in the first ten verses of John 10 as part of a much larger, larger context. The whole context of this story begins at the first verse of John chapter 9 and goes through verse 21 of chapter 10. It's all one massive textual unit that follows a structural pattern often used by John. First, there is a sign, then dialogue, then a sermon. Now, in this case, the sign is the healing of a man born blind. To summarize, Jesus heals this man who had been born blind, and the religious authorities criticize Jesus for healing him on the Sabbath. And then a cast of characters flows through this scene, engaging in dialogue, including the formerly blind man's parents. And no one understands what's going on until the man born blind finally gets it, and then Jesus ends the dialogue by telling the religious authorities that they are blind, that seeing God has to do with the heart and the soul, not with the eyes, and the religious authorities respond by telling Jesus he's crazy. 
Now, all of that leads us to Jesus' sermon about shepherds and sheep that we read the beginning of this morning. The religious leaders think that they are in charge of the gate. They get to decide who comes in and goes out. In this sermon, which is kind of a parable, really, Jesus says, no, that's not it. He presents a cast of characters, shepherd, sheep, thieves, banquet, gatekeepers, strangers, and yes, even a gate is the character. And we see intriguing pictures emerge as we read this parable. The stealth entrance into the sheepfold, knowing the voice of another, being someone's own, having your name called. No one seems to get it. Jesus is talking to the religious authorities. They certainly don't. And I wish I had time to unpack every detail of Jesus' sermon because every detail matters. But I've already talked for a while, so let me, under, let me uh, <clears throat> summarize it in this way. Misunderstanding is a frequent reaction to Jesus in which Jesus responds with an invitation to a more significant relationship. In other words, when we don't understand Jesus, and I sometimes really don't understand Jesus, it is always an invitation to engage him on a deeper level, to walk through the gate. So the thieves and the bandits, those are the ones that the sheep do not know and to whom they will not listen. You know, each of those characters is there to make the point that Jesus is the true gate, not the religious authorities. The thieves and bandits and strangers try to fool you into thinking that they are the gate, that they are in charge of the gate, but they are not. Jesus is. Jesus' people know his voice, and when they hear his voice, they know that he is in charge of the gate letting people in the door. We are not in charge of the door. Jesus is. The thieves and bandits, well, you know, they're like rules and dogmas that we sometimes put out there in the church that prevent people from hearing Jesus' voice. They are barriers to what Jesus calls at the end of the passage this morning, the abundant life. It is important for us to remember that we are not gatekeepers for the church. Jesus is. It is Jesus who lets people in and out, not the religious authorities like me. And we need to know his voice when we hear it. The voice of Jesus says, I am the gate, and that will lead to abundant life. His voice is the one that says, love one another as I have loved you. And when we hear that, we know that it is the voice of Jesus. We know his voice. We used to have this dog named Cinnamon. She wasn't very well behaved. I was reminded of her actually this morning when I got out of the shower and reached for a towel. It had a big hole in it. When Cinnamon was a puppy, she got into the laundry sometimes, and she chewed holes in a lot of our towels. I think of her when I use one of those towels. Well, we got her from the Humane Society when our twin girls were seven years old. The vet called her a boxer mix, but she was a lot more mix than boxer. It wasn't my idea to get cinnamon. I was outvoted. Don't get me wrong, I love dogs, but I really didn't feel like I had time for a dog, so I figured we could be friends, but that others living in the house would be responsible for her. That wasn't to be. Cinnamon decided that my voice would be the voice that she would follow. My wife Jane and our daughters would scold her for one of her frequent misbehaviors, and she would look at them quizzically. But if I walked into the room and saw the remains of a block of Parmesan cheese she stole from the kitchen counter and spoke to her firmly, she would lower her head and go to her timeout corner. She knew my voice. But here's the thing. Somehow she knew that I cared for her. She wanted to be on the same side of the door that I was on. 
If I went outside, she wanted to be outside. If I came into the house, she wanted to be into the, in the house. I was her gate. She knew that if she was with me, I would be safe. She would be safe. When we walk through the door with Jesus, respond to his voice, we too will be safe. That's the kind of gate Jesus is. Because you see, there are a lot of doors out there, a lot of thieves and bandits yelling at those doors, telling you that if you just get that job, or drive this car, or live in that neighborhood, or overcome this health challenge, that you can walk through the gate into abundant life. It isn't true. Those things are thieves and bandits, and they'll sap the life right out of you. They are barriers to the abundant life, because they cannot last. But when we understand that Jesus is the gate, the door, we begin to see that abundant life isn't a goal for which to strive, but rather a consequence and a gift of following the one who opened the eyes of the blind, fed the hungry, comforted the distraught, and everywhere and always witnessed to the universal and unending love of God. When we bear witness to the universal and unending love of God for all people everywhere, then we walk through Jesus' door and finally see that there are no barriers to the abundant life. Because when we follow Jesus' commandment to love others, every other, even in the middle of a pandemic, we will hear Jesus call our name, and then we will always be on the right side of the gate. As we come now to our time of prayer, I hope that you will go on to our website and find the bulletin insert for today, which includes our joys and concerns that we bring to prayer. I hope you will keep that with you throughout the week, remembering in your prayers those in our community in need of our support. We lift up to God in prayer today all of those who are working in the medical field, especially those who are caring for patients with coronavirus and who are searching for a cure or a treatment. We pray that you would support them in their work. We also pray for the first responders who are out there keeping us safe. And we also pray for educators uh, who are helping our students continue to learn at home and for parents who are becoming teachers in ways they never expected they might have to. We also pray for our leaders on the federal, state, and local level that they might make wise and prudent decisions moving forward as we go through this crisis. And we also hold in prayer today the Berardi family, Diane, Linda, Tracy, and Scott, Tegan, Jeff, Richard, and Elva, Joshua, Sydney, Brenda, Amy, Paul, and Rob, Dennis, Christine, Todd, and Bob, Linda, Michael, Dave, Beth and Chris, Foster, Michael, Priscilla, Danny, Hanny, Hannah, Tammy, Joey, Bevan, and the Ryan family. And we continue to pray for the Babix family, Carolyn, Bill, Carol, Roberta, David, DJ and his family, Gordon, Bill, Candy, Kathy, Amanda and Kathy, Doris, Ken, Jarvis, Debbie, Guy, Brenda, Peter, Sandy, Billy, Daria, Tony, Nellie, Mary Tom, and Louise. And we also hold in prayer our Family Promise affiliate and all of the volunteers and staff who are serving the host families and the families as well. And our Stephen ministers and all their care receivers, 
our caring ministry team, and all of our caring ministry friends. And now I invite you to name your joys and your concerns that you bring to God in prayer today. Let us be a community in prayer. Shepherding God, in a dangerous world, let us hear your voice and come through your gate. We pray for the whole church, that we may be devoted to your word and to the universal fellowship, being generous to all who have need. And we pray for the earth, for green pastures and still waters, that we may restore them to the goodness and purity that they had at the time you created them. We pray for the people of the world, their nations and leaders, that your wisdom and peace may govern all, so that no one will fear. We pray for all those in need, for those in want, those ill and those dying, those suffering from the coronavirus, that we may be the banquet that you have set before them as we anoint them, feed them, comfort them in your name. And we pray for ourselves, our families, and those we love. May no one live in fear. May all dwell in your presence. Blessed are you, great shepherd, who, through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, gives us goodness and mercy, leads us down right paths, and restores our souls. We pray these in all things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Even though our building is closed, our church is open, because you are the church. And the work of our church continues in this community and across the world. Your financial support is still needed for the work of this church to continue. So if you are able, we hope that you will continue to give your pledges and tithes for this important work. I certainly understand that not all of you will be able to do that if you have lost your job or have been furloughed or are otherwise struggling we pray for you every day and we want to do our best to support you but if you are able to give we invite you to contribute either online or to make a contribution by mailing it to the church at fcc fccsouthington.org forward slash give. There are descriptions of all of the many ways that you can make your gift to the ministries of this church. I am so deeply grateful for your support of this ministry, your commitment to this church, and for your incredible generosity. Our morning offering will now be received.
do earnestly repent of their sins and seek to love God, neighbor, and self with all their hearts, you who desire to walk in newness of life, according to the grace of God and the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, draw near with reverence, praise, and thanksgiving to this, the table of our Lord. Come, not because you must, but because you may. Come not to profess that any of us by our own merits is righteous, but to confess that all of us stand in need of the forgiving mercy of God. Come not to support any division within Christ's church, but to declare that at this table all who believe in him are one. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek a spirit, for this is Christ's table, and it is open to all who seek him, without a single exception. So come and eat. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and this fruit of the vine, that it may be for us sacraments of your grace, constant reminders of your loving presence in our lives. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered his friends, the men, women, and children who shared in his ministry, and he took bread. He gave thanks to God, and he blessed it, and then he broke it, and he gave it to his friends, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I offer you this bread. Take it and eat it, remembering that Christ is the bread of life. Amen. And after supper, he also took the cup. And giving thanks to God, he blessed it and he gave it to his friends, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I offer you this cup. Please drink from it, all of you, remembering that Christ is the cup of salvation. A flood of wonder, a flood of praise, a flood of healing in this place. We bring our broken selves to you and ask you for your life-giving grace, the living water in earth spring. Make us whole and wash us clean. Living water, inner spring. Refresh our faith in things unseen. A burst of wonder, a burst of praise, a burst of healing in this place. Your energy and your light, you penetrate our heart's dark space. Oh, light of love, oh, light divine, you permeate our broken life. Oh, light of love, oh, light divine, With lives that shine, may we arise. shepherd to we trust in you you are the way we follow you truth and life live in you leaven of 
peace, O bread of life, make us all things new as you intend. Leaven of peace, O bread of life, may we be faithful till the end. A flood of wonder, a flood of praise, a flood of healing in this place. We bring our broken selves to you. Let us pray. We thank you, Almighty God, for refreshing us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world with courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. May God, who calls us by name, lead you out into green pastures and lead you into the safety of Christ fold. In the name of God, who created you, Christ, who redeemed you, and the Holy Spirit, who sustains you, may you go now and live in peace. Amen.
I'll send him a hard copy.